San Jose State head basketball coach John Prelo joins me. I'm Brian Fenley with Fox Sports Radio. Coach, I want to get into San Jose State basketball in just a moment, but what's it like loving basketball and growing up in New York City? Well, yeah. Okay, so let's have some clarity on that. <laughs> I was born in New York City. Okay. Okay. Um, but I grew up, meaning I was raised in Teaneck, New Jersey. Okay. So, yes. But still, again, 15 minutes away from, from New York City, where I grew up. Um, wow, back then, coming up in high school, uh, New York City was hot in terms of basketball players. Oh, I mean, um, you know, it, you could argue the fact that it was probably uh, the mecca of, of yeah. basketball. And, and people probably will, will say that to this day. Uh, but, but basketball has is, is grown so much since then um, uh, in America globally. But, but back then when I was coming up, I mean, you know, Mark Jackson, Pearl Washington, Kenny Smith, um, those guys were in college and they were on fire in terms of, you know, what the Big East was back then. And just, I mean, basketball was everywhere and people were playing it everywhere. And that's the environment that I grew up in. Um, you know, Kenny, Kenny Anderson, um, you know, Stefan Marbury. I mean, there's so many guards um, back in that era. But, um, yeah, it was, it was a great time. Uh, growing up then and I mean that's how I molded my game you know I played uh, for Teaneck High School in New Jersey but I would always go over to New York and play all the time in Rucker Park and West 4th Street and I, I, I did it all when it came to that stuff. As far as playing on the playground in New York City just how heated were were those battles for you on the court do you remember somewhere I mean it was super competitive and physical that catch your mind right away? Yeah um you know, playing Rucker was, um, I mean, it, it, it's in your face and it is a, a situation where it's, it's fight or flight in terms of your game. Wow. Not literally fight. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Fight or flight in terms of where your game is and what you want it to be and how good you think you are. Um, you will get exposed if your game is not up to par very quickly wow. uh, in, in New York City. So. Um, that was the environment that I grew up in. And again, I went back and forth. I played summer ball in New York. I played in New Jersey. You know, I was playing all the time, every day. I would take the bus from New Jersey over into New York and play uh, by myself, 10th grade, 11th grade. Like, I probably wouldn't allow my son to get on a public bus right now and just sure. go his own. Yeah. The world has changed so much. But... Uh, I mean, back then, I mean, that's wow. what they did, yeah. The, the passion for basketball is there, no question about it. And you are now channeling that into being a coach for the Spartans. And you have this vision for the program and a way that you want to build things up. What are the actions you're taking to, to generate the hype and to convince players that guys – the results are going to come. Just be patient. We have something in place here. It will come. Uh, I think that's the biggest challenge. I think it's the biggest challenge for every coach around the country. Um, when I was coming up in college, um, it wasn't the norm for kids to just get up and transfer and go. Um, now, I think, I, and you might want to look into the numbers on this, but I think there's yep. over 1,000 people that have been in the portal uh, for in just in 2009 or 20, 2019, 20. So um, that says a lot because that means there's a lot of moving pieces. So when you're trying to build something, uh, retention is very important um, in that. And it's hard in this day and age. Um, and I think it's going to, it, it might even be worse when you start talking about uh, the one time transfer sure. rate that might come in a year or two here. Um, so, yes making the kids or showing the kids the light or the belief in that's where there's a lot of communication, um, a lot of steady growth. And we have guys that have bought in uh, to that, to that vision. One of them being Seneca Knight, uh, who 
is going to be a junior. Um, you know, by the stats, he's he's our best player right now statistically in, in what he does and what he what he produces. But we also have a lot of other guys on our team um, that are valuable uh, veterans that can contribute uh, that I think are going to help us. And we signed like six new guys, one of them being a JUCO guy and then five of them being high school guys. So the the challenge in this day and age, to answer your question, is to try and have continuity and retention uh, with your team, but very difficult. Sure. And it has nothing really to do with losing or winning. Like, it's to a point where kids are just moving because they just want to move. Like. Yeah. They have the right to be able to do that. So that's what, that's what makes it tough. When you're trying to rebuild something, rather than reload, you're trying sure. to rebuild. I was listening to an interview with Purdue head coach Matt Painter, and he was talking about the whole transfer thing and how a lot of guys that transfer, you don't really see guys go to the NBA or go pro in the league who have transferred. Like, you, you, you don't see that as often it's usually a guy that stays with one program and that one of the challenges I'm sure coach, because I would certainly think that you have this straightforward perception of how you want to, to coach. Like you want to be upfront with your guys. You want to let them know exactly what you think of them, because I think that's important as far as gaining the respect and the trust of your players. Is it challenging at times because some guys you have to kind of mold the way you talk to them to get the most out of them, knowing their personality and knowing what's going to get them to, to get to where you think they can get, even if they don't see it themselves. Well, I think, I think, yes, there is some truth in that. And then there are the objective truths. And the objective truths are what actually happens when you're on the court. Sure. So when the ball gets thrown up, something has to happen, right? There has to be a game that's going to be played. Some guys are going to make shots. Some guys aren't. Some guys are going to be able to make plays. Some guys aren't. And what happens is um, there, there are stats that are formulated off of that, right? Which have nothing to do with maybe how someone might feel that day. It has to do with what happened in that, in that moment. So I try to let our players know the reality of what the situations are by watching a lot of film and showing them exactly what is happening on the court. Now, as that process plays itself out, a day, a week, a month, there's a lot of stats involved. And then, during that path, you start to figure out what someone might be deficient in or what they might be doing really well in. Continue the things that you're doing well. Let's try and work on the things that you might be deficient in, especially if you want to become a very efficient player, right? We're talking just basketball here. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about off the court stuff and building them as young men and we're just talking about the basketball part, right? I think yeah. that's what your question was. And yeah. So that's where all of those objective truths start to come out. And you get honest feedback. And you give honest feedback to your student athlete when you're trying to help them develop. Yes. And, and as a coach, when you are trying to teach and you're trying to articulate that to young people or to your student athletes, um, I think that's where the student athlete can grow and then the coach can understand and the student athlete can understand and then that's how you start to build synergy because then you start showing them exactly what is happening rather than what you think and what you might wish to happen. Sure. And that's why I say objective truth not wishing truth. We're talking about objectivity. You go out there, if you can shoot or make plays, that's going to happen. If you can't, guess what? That's also going to happen. And then we have to have a discussion on how can I help you be able to produce and play well in that moment? 
objectively, you nearly took down San Diego State last year. And that was a very close game. How do you look at that one as a potential turning point for your program moving forward? Um, yeah, I mean, it came down to a a 25-foot shot from a, from a really, really good player. And that happens in the game that we play. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from that game was that on any given day, and this is the difference between teams that are rebuilding, like what we're trying to do, and then teams that are consistent, which would be San Diego State, right? On any given day, you can beat someone sure. in this game of basketball. The teams that are more consistent are the ones that can do it day in and day out, even if they're not playing up to par. They figure out a way to win. Other teams that are not at that point or are trying to get there are teams that are trying to build. So we are learning how to win. So in order to do that, you have to keep putting yourself in position to, to be able to get that win. I mean, that was, a, that was a major step for our program is just because we have never been that close. Uh, in, in my tenure, we've never been that close to beating them there. And, again, it came down to, you know, a 25-foot shot um, for, them, for them to beat us. When it comes down to how much in-person interaction you're able to have with your guys as far as workouts and understanding the restrictions that are taking place, what is it like as you try to, to coach them up and, and work out and stay game fit when that season does eventually start? Well, I mean, that's, that's tough. Um, you know, right now our guys are slated to come back uh, this Saturday and our school, uh, we have great leadership uh, with President Papazian and, and our athletic director, Marie Twitt. Uh, we've, we've talked uh, a lot with our other sports and we're putting together protocols for our players as they return uh, in terms of how we phase back into some type of normalcy. Um, you know, we're working on um, working out a lot outside training, sure. stuff like that to try and stay in shape. So uh, that's what we're doing right now. And we will continue to uh, adapt and we will continue to do what's best for our student athletes. John, my final question for you, as far as adapting and with the composition of players you have on your roster, what is the style, the brand of basketball that you're working towards this upcoming year that you want to show off on the court? Uh, that's going to be hard to answer right now just because we didn't have uh, summer access. Sure. So, and I'm not saying I wait till summer access to figure out what I want to run. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little more organized than that, but um, you figure out a lot more about your team. Uh, usually I'm a three out, two in type of coach, but last year we played a lot of four out, one in. Uh, we, we shot a lot more threes than we did last year. So I have a lot of players on our team that are versatile. So I think we're gonna probably do a mixture of both, uh, four out, one in, three out, two in, uh, just so we can give teams a different look. Uh, so I think, I think that's been good for us. John, I'm excited to see it all mesh together for you. I'll be watching and really excited to see how this program continues to progress under your watch. John Prelo, head coach for San Jose State. I'm Brian Fenley. Thanks again, Sean. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate it.